um, welcome to the Meditative Expressions Artist Talk. Um, can you mute that? I don't know how. Sorry, I, my, my partner is next to me and he's also tuned in. So there's some oh, no. echo situation. Okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce the artists and then we will do a virtual tour of the online exhibition. And then we can get into um, the conversational part. Um, in the past, I've done a more structured interview and I, Lily and I, and I have some history and I feel like it's just more organic to just kind of have a have a conversation rather than just doing a presentation. So if you're used to the regular format, today is going to be a little different. Um, so yeah, let me just uh, briefly introduce the artist and then we can get into the tour. And if you have any questions throughout the art, um, the talk, feel free to just type your question or comment in the chat box. Um, I can share those with the artist and I can also, um, that way we can actually regulate the Q&A section um, in a more efficient manner. Great. So Lillian and Maria are joining us today. Um, they will answer any questions, hopefully, that you have. Um, so let me just introduce them. Um, Lillian J. Thorpe is a photo montage artist. Born in Indiana, Thorpe moved to Brooksville, Maine at age 10. Her early experience at a Waldorf school fueled and encouraged her creativity and set her on an artistic path. In 2014, she received her BFA from Pratt Institute in Photography. She then went on to receive her MS in the History of Art and Design from Pratt in 2017. After 13 years in Brooklyn, New York, Thorpe relocated to Portland in 2022. Her work can be found in, a pri in private collections throughout the United States and globally. Maria Michurina, sorry. <clears throat> is a Russian-born artist born in the Seattle area. Since she was raised in a family of physicists, mathematics was her career path and still remains a part of her life. Michirina works in a few different media, collage, gouache, oil, and printmaking, and her practice is rooted in a combination of observation, imagination, memories, and dreams. So I'm just going to admit, sorry if you can hear the, the sounds. Um, I'm not sure how to mute that. So um, we'll just quickly go over the tours part of the talk. Sorry, I'm just, uh, technology is still a really a struggle point for me. Um, so I hope you can all see the screen. Okay. All righty. Hey! 
Great. Um, so just as a quick tour of the rest of the website, um, the work, selected works of each artist can be found under um, their names. And if you click on these names, there, it leads to you to the website of the artist. Um, and feel free to just spend as much time as you want. And if you can, leave a message at the end. We have an online guest book, so you, you can leave comments or leave your contact info to stay in touch with us and with the artist. Um, we'll share all of these information at the end of the exhibition. So let me just stop sharing this for a second. Um, so great. I hope the music came through all right. Um, Zoom sometimes has some issues with the sound, but um, so let's just kind of dive right into the conversation part. I guess the first thing that I had in mind is if, if you had any thoughts about the exhibition in combination with the music or just seeing your work um, in conversation with another artist. If there's any thoughts from you, you guys, Lillian or Maria, either one. Well, I love your music choice. Um, I think it's always interesting to see, you know, what other people are drawn to and, you know, in terms of the pairing. And Maria, I really love your work so much. Um, I'm so happy to meet you over the Zoom. And Misa, I think the pairing was super interesting. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about why you decided to pair us together, but I sort of feel some similar sensitivities in Maria's work. You know, there's a quietness, a meditativeness, you know, linking back to the title. Um, I just, I think it's a beautiful pairing. Um, yeah, and I'm honored to be half of that pairing. <laughs> You're really honored. <laughs> yeah, I also like have to say that I know Lillian because of Misa and because of this show. And it was a nice uh, discovery. So uh, it's also interesting for me how you miss up Vertas and uh, what you think, because uh, like my works are coming from slightly different eras for me. And it was good to see that they're actually seen as one thing um, from outside. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I never, I always struggle trying to pair music in a way that doesn't overwhelm or overpower mm -hmm. the works themselves. Um, so I just remember when I was planning exhibitions, I just knew I definitely want you, Lillian, like I definitely wanted you in part of the show. And I don't know how it happened, but I came across Maria's work. I think you might have followed me on Instagram and then I started looking all over your work and I was like, wow, these are powerful images. And the first thing that came to my mind was solitude the wonder and the mystery and and the the vibrancy of quiet poetry. And I know Lillian, you also manage another Instagram account um, that is really just about quiet visual poetry. And I honestly think that had influenced me a lot uh, mm -hmm. over the course of the last few years as I was pursuing a different way of um, making images or thinking about images, um, the sense of time and space there's a specificity with either the inspiration or kind of the effects that these images create. So when I was putting you guys together, I just thought, wow, these are two different ways of expressing that same quality. And the music kind of came perfectly when I, Mountain Man is the, the band and I've listened to their music for over two years now. And I just always loved kind of that it's it's simple but it, it it's so rich you know it's it's about that layering of of vocals so there are three singers in that band and everybody has a role right and it, I, I think of kind of paintings or images similarly um the marks have a role the colors have a role the shapes that they create together everything is creating that pictorial force so that's just my little blurb of how i was kind of navigating putting your works together. And I'm, I'm really happy about this one. And I'm glad to hear that you enjoy them too, because sometimes that's kind of that, um, the, the risk of creative liberty is like, would it work? And even if it works with the artist, honor that intention, or am I honoring the artist's work as much as I can? Um, so yeah, that's just like a, it's still like an ongoing experiment trying to learn how to see art differently or experience art differently. And I think that is just a very 
um, maybe selfish way of saying, this is how I experience the works and I want everybody to kind of enjoy that part as well. Um, curation is adding an extra layer of narrative in some way. So I think that's kind of a fun space for artists to engage in. But anyway, sorry, that's like a long way of saying, I just really enjoyed making it. Um, so I know that both of you have roles outside of being an artist. And I'm just curious, before we even dive into the works, um, how are the roles? So Maria, I know we talked about a little bit about like what we do outside of making art. And you mentioned that you're a teacher just like me. And Lillian, I've known you since you worked at <laughs> Nancy Margolis Gallery, and now you're the director. Um, I'm just curious, how do the roles outside of being an artist affect the way you engage with or think about art? I'm just kind of throwing you guys into the deep end. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, fortunately, my career as a gallery owner and director is very much, of course, linked in the art world. So. I get a lot of inspiration from that job. I work with some amazing painters and we'll probably touch on this a little bit later in the conversation, but my work, even though it's primarily rooted in photography, I am most influenced by painting and by painters. Um, and going back to art history, my biggest influences are painters. So um, the gallery where the gallery I run is uh, primarily represents contemporary painters. We have two sculptors, um, but sort of being immersed every single day in the paintings of other people um, and hearing about their process and really getting to build those relationships. Um, it's definitely sort of fuel to my creative fire. It makes me want to keep working and it, I get and inspired by many of the people I work with. Um, and it just keeps me sort of in tune with what's going on in the art world and how it could relate back to my own work. So for me, I think the two go very hand in hand and I feel fortunate that my you know, day job can so seamlessly inform my artwork. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a slightly different story because I teach something not very much related to art, it is mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I graduated um, with math major um, some time ago. So I'd say uh, I've worked with the students a lot and uh, no matter what they study, I learn a lot about their work process and curiosity and how they look at the unknown it's always interesting and applicable in any area. Uh, and very recently, it was this week actually, I taught my very first art workshop and that was a very new experience. And I would say everything was applicable to what I'm working on in terms of art because preparing uh, the talk and preparing the workshop and putting all the thoughts together was priceless. Um, and very inspiring. Yeah, thank you. I think one thing that I think now, especially like we're in 2022, I think we have a tendency to kind of compartmentalize disciplines and things. Um, but you know, if we look at Piero della Francesca, he was a ma mathematician and it's kind of a crazy thing of like having the need, and I'm not saying that applies to everyone, but I think we, in this in this time in this contemporary time we we feel the need to almost just be that one thing or be specialized in that one thing and kind of overlook other disciplines and the insights that we can get in how we translate these other knowledge into painting or whatever you do you know collage or photo montage and so i think what i really appreciate about both of your work is that it, it's not a very direct path of addressing painting, but it's very painterly and the, the language is there. Um, so I'm curious to ask this, um, is there any central thread that ties your progression of works over the last few years? Um, it could be either a formal inquiry or even subject matter in your work. Um, let's see, one of the themes that I'm always thinking about is, uh, how quietness plays a role in my work. And then also um, just transporting 
the viewer into an emotional state. Um, so again, I can get more into these specifics in a little bit, but I'm not necessarily trying to um, communicate a specific time and place, but rather a specific emotion. Um, and actually, I mean, you can have whatever emotion you want when you look at my work, but that's where I'm coming from. Um, I have this emotional connection to quietness and to uh, the natural world. And so when I'm creating my photo montages, I'm in that emotional state and just trying to communicate it through the composition. And that has been something that has tied all of my work together, even though visually my styles have evolved and changed and sort of ebbed and flowed. But um, the constant has definitely been um, trying to articulate a strong mood and relay a sense of um, quietness, maybe not silence, but quietness. Well, hold on, hold on. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point. What's the difference to you between quietness and silence? Yeah, you asked me this a couple of years ago. And I I didn't know, well, I didn't know the answer then, but I've thought about it for a long time. And I don't know if I, you know, still like have the correct answer. But um, to me, silence is something more um, like permanent or all encompassing, whereas uh, quietness can be a state of mind, it can be, um, you can have a quiet moment within a noisy atmosphere. Um, I feel like there's something more emotional about quietness, whereas silence is just um, like a blanket of, um, I'm not describing it well. In my head, I can feel the difference. Um, do you know what I mean? <laughs> what you're saying is, and, and I could be wrong, but like silence feels more stagnant. Yeah. Uh, I think quietness has something to do with kind of, it's rhythmic or it, there's mm -hmm. a sense of ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like, it's not stagnant in any way. That's so true. Me. Yep. And just how quietness sort of has a psychological component also. And, you know, a person can be in a quiet mood, but there's a lot of activity sometimes within quietness, whereas silence, I think, as you said, stagnant is a good way to put it. It's just, it's uh, completely still. And I think there's something more dynamic to quietness. Yeah. Um, I know that I, I, I kind of, I kind of group this exhibition as meditative expressions. And I know that I know Lillian's work is really about that quietness, that, that the poetry that can come from these these encounters where I feel like I'm in the middle of the wood or something, you know, like looking out and I'm just absorbed totally in that space. Um, but I'm curious to hear about your kind of inspiration or idea, Maria, whether or not quietness is a motivator in your work, or it's just something that kind of happened as a result of exploring and searching for the image. I think it just happens. And you <laughs> asked about uh, the past few years, and I've been listening to Lillian and thinking about myself. And I personally feel like um, my life began in 2018 or 2019 in a way. Mm -hmm. So the past few years is pretty much just maybe everything uh, I feel like I really had. Uh, and there were so many changes during this uh, times and so many discoveries that it's hard to narrow it down. Uh, but talking in the past couple of years um, during the pandemic, there was a change uh, because of isolation. Uh, I felt like being outside much more uh, and I live um, in a pretty quiet area surrounded by many um, nice natural places, rivers and uh, forests. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time there and um, that's where the landscapes are coming from. And before I was very curious about um, the human figure and um, all sorts of things which are happening to us. Uh, and it was a big change. Like I was working on the figure a lot and then from 2020, uh, I kind of switched to landscape, which is still the same figures. They are just trees and 
Something that stood out to me about your work, Maria, is the text. I can't really read the language, but something about the borders and there's this really decorative element of including text and there's their dates and it feels almost it's not just a painting. It, it felt like an object and I, I don't mean it in a bad way. I actually mean it as like it, it feels like it's kind of like a timestamp of, of some sort. Sort of like an illuminated manuscript. How they yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a yeah. much more elegant way of talking about this. Oh uh, my gosh, it's Saturday. My brain is a little <laughs> all over the place. But yeah, can you speak a little bit in terms of like, how have you decided to kind of have these, I would call inscriptions, I know it's not, but you know, these very intentional um, inclusion of these texts and dates? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, thank you. Sometimes I feel that um, I'm afraid to forget things. And I'm just kind of documenting them. <laughs> um, and even if these are not very like real things, but coming more from uh, dreams, imagination, uh, they still happened in a way. And I still want to document them. And I also like the combination of uh, text and image because when you combine these two text stops being um, a text it, it becomes an image too it's like small shapes compared to the larger shapes of the painting and um, I like this variety actually uh, one of my friends um, sent me a drawing of my painting and um, this drawing like she replicated the letters and mm. first i could read easily uh because she was copying very carefully and then it was just some impression of the letters and i loved it so much because it's still these kind of shapes but they are completely not letters anymore and um that was good to see i think it's a strange thing to think about how language can so quickly fall apart when you don't recognize the systems and i'm i'm thinking just about a lot of my own upbringing i, I grew up in hong kong and i did a lot of calligraphy and the, the the chinese characters largely came out of pictures so like mountains you know like there are these shapes that symbolize certain things and the way that you place certain um parts kind of determine what that word means and over time it became a set of language or or characters and i think it's really strange to like think of language that way where it's not just words that carry meaning but it's it's almost like this thing that we could also see as pictures um so that's something that kind of stood out to me when i saw that i i didn't i know it's language but i i couldn't help but to think about kind of what you're saying like the scale of these shapes and I think the the texts are just so delicate and intricate and I feel like there's this echo or, or or conversation between these words and image and it's a really hard thing to pull off I think um it's really hard to include text and have that be part of the image um without also, the, mm -hmm. sorry what's that uh I also feel like for me it's sort of a statement that I finished the work and that's what it is about. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that I, I never go back to it after <laughs> I it, but yeah. it's a statement. Something that um, kind of came to my mind just now as you both were talking about kind of what fuels your work. Uh, Maria, you mentioned something about wanting to document things and not wanting to forget things and that being part of the way you construct your images. And for you, Lillian, I met you in New York and I knew Maine was always a big part of your life. It, it, and it, it's just a big part of your, I don't wanna say spiritual, but your your image just do feel that way. I would say just like a deep, it's a deep space. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it really influenced the way that you construct these images. So I guess my, my follow-up question to both of those statements is what, is there any other roles or any other purpose that you kind of want your art to be other than the the fact that like you're creating these images mostly out of need or, or a sense of necessity what else do what what other purposes do these images serve for you as just a fun. artist hmm? it's just fun it's just fun that's great <laughs> that's that's how it is for me too yeah 
That's good. It should be fun. And it's also fun for me. Um, when I first started getting into photo montage, I was, it was in my you know, third year of college and I was in New York city and I was feeling, um, really upset about how technology was sort of inundating people's lives. And this is right when Google Glass came out, which was the glasses wow. that were computers. And I just had this awful dystopic um, thought that everybody was just gonna go around looking at each other through screens. And you know, our current reality is not that much different, but fortunately Google Glass didn't take off that much. But um, anyway, I, I was surrounded by uh, just the effects of technology and I was feeling extremely overstimulated. And the reason I started creating these fictional landscapes was I wanted to uh, go back mentally to a world that was um, just sort of appreciated natural beauty and was rooted in nature. And I didn't really have anything man-made in my pictures or no indicators of the year. So, you know, I didn't want necessarily someone to look at my work and think, oh, this was obviously made in 2014 or something. It was, I left it sort of timeless in that sense. Um, but for me at the time, the process of creating those works was not just fun, but super cathartic. And it felt like a mental escape from, um, this just like highly stimulated, extroverted, loud technological world. And I'm not a Luddite and I use um, technology. I mean, that's sort of an irony. My work is half of it is digital. So I'm using digital means to create, you know, uh, compositions that hopefully uh, don't scream technology, but are actually, you know, rooted more in the earth. That's great. Um, yeah, the, the concept of timelessness is, is something that I feel like that's, that bar is high, you know, like I think most artists consciously or subconsciously do want their work to feel timeless. Um, and I was recently, I don't know if this is relevant at all, but I was talking about altar pieces and the way that they are set up and it narrates time, right? The, some characters reappear over and over. I'm, that's not in your case, like that's, that's not the way that you're engaging with time. You're just kind of almost making that information arbitrary mm -hmm. for the sake of letting the image speak for itself uh, to create a sense of timelessness or, or that space that just stands still. And I think that's why I'm always just moved by your images. And I, I'm, I'm pretty certain it's, it's had an effect on me, how I compose my images and the way that I think about the pace or the the transition, the, that that space, like when you have a very tonally established work, it, it's it's a slower read of the image. And I think both of your work have that quality. Um, it's just done very differently. And so I think I just really appreciate when you said, I just want my work to kind of have that quality of timelessness. Um, but this is more a follow-up question for Lillian. I think Maine was like a big, big, factor into how you're kind of composing these almost nostalgic moments or like, mm -hmm. you know, this heightened um, emotional state of being in these landscapes while you were in New York. Mm -hmm. Now that you're back in Maine, does that change? How does your images change at this point? Yeah, that's a really good question. I feel like when I was in New York creating art, it was sort of a reaction against my environment. And I fantasized even more because I sort of needed my fantasies to get me through the day. I mean, I really do love New York, but um, it was, you know, hard emotionally. It was just very chaotic. Um, now that I'm in Maine, I definitely feel sort of a more steady sense of inspiration. Um, and I feel like I have to, um, I'm not like desperately trying to change my mental state and put myself in another world. I'm sort of yeah. in an environment that um, can feed my artwork more directly. So 
All that said, since my move, which was only just a few months ago, I've been sort of extra busy. So I haven't really had the opportunity to create fresh brand new pieces, but I can tell already that when I do have that time to really devote to my work again, um, it will be a slightly different experience because I just sort of have this built-in inspiration that, um, you know, I can just, you know, go to the grocery store and then see a beautiful scene that just sort of startles me. And that will be my fuel for creating a piece rather than trying to escape the environment in New York and, uh, you know, uh, visualize a place I would rather be and in that place now. So I think it definitely will have a profound impact on my work um, and it will make the whole process, I think, more streamlined. I wonder if it will get louder <laughs> now that you're in a quiet <laughs> totally. place. I know. I hope not. Well, we'll see, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I think I think both of your work kind of communicate a sense of longing. Maybe that's more of what I'm trying to get at. It's not just mm -hmm. quietness. There's this deep longing and nostalgia. And Maria, you and I talked quite a bit just over email, these exchanges had been so lovely. And I feel like I, I've gotten to know you more just through the conversation we had about just not being part of, you know, we're not, I think both of us are not from the US. Mm -hmm. And there's just these things that are kind of characteristics of, of people that are not necessarily that that are experienced displacement. And so I don't want to speak for your work, but I, I definitely feel that sense of longing. And I think my heart just knows when I see the works, it's like, oh yeah, I, I, I know that feeling. And mm -hmm. I think it's powerful when the works can speak volumes about these deeper human conditions, mm -hmm. you know? I like that you use the word nostalgic and I won't, you know, keep going too long because I want to hear what Maria says, but um, I love longing. I mean, it's just like a state of mind that I love being in. And I feel like I romanticize everything. I romanticize <laughs> the past. I romanticize the future. Um, so I love being in that state of like extreme nostalgia or longing. So I think you hit the nail on the head that I'm definitely translating that into my work. Maria, do you have any thoughts? Sorry. <laughs> I kind of put you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, like what you said that uh, we are both not from the US and probably this feeling is coming from being in an environment which is new. Uh, I don't think it's the case. Um, maybe partially. Uh, I just, like, during the whole life, uh, I liked being alone and in nature as much as possible. And I had this uh, escapes like I was born in a big city uh, in Moscow and you never have escape there in a way from people uh, so I had these escapes we had a little like primitive house my family had primitive house outside of Moscow and I was going there and staying there for a few months a year completely alone in the wilderness with no um, internet or other <laughs> things um, which belong to cities. So I just always liked it. And about um, painting overall, uh, I'd say it's not an attempt to convey a feeling. It's just, I like the color and I like um, the action, I guess, of working with the color. And uh, I like the shapes. They bring me a lot of joy. And if I, Stop having this joy. I'll stop painting. But for now, I have it. So <laughs> please don't stop. <laughs> I love your work. I want to keep seeing your works. Um, yeah, thank you for um, clarifying that. Because you know, I'm just one person, and I it's easy to just kind of project my my sense of narrative into other people's works. But there are things that I actually did want to ask specifically more about your works, both of your works. Um, Maria, in your work, maybe this is not, this is just something I'm, I'm, as I'm kind of putting the show together, I realize that there are quite a bit of animals throughout your work. I mean, more specifically the geese, or like, I think there's one that's about salmon, and there's one that's about the deer. Um, and then with Lily in your work, I think the moon is a really central motif. And so there are just, I'm just wondering if there's anything about these particular motifs that 
you feel were important or is there anything that's non-negotiable in your work? Because when, when things start appearing consistently, it felt like they needed to be there. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. Who's the first? <laughs> you can go first. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so animals appeared in my work uh, in 2020 when the pandemic began. And there are plenty of animals outside here. Okay, I open my door, I see animals. Uh, like around my place, there are coyotes, bobcats, um, deer, uh, rabbits, opossums, many of them. <laughs> and you go farther, you see geese, goats, uh, different birds. So that was one of the parts. I was just going outside, seeing the animals, not people. Uh, <laughs> and the second thing, uh, why animals came into the paintings or collages, um, because I started looking at um, Roman reliefs a lot, and they have a lot of combination, a lot of combinations of animals and human. And I think these are two interesting shapes together. Um, so I like this part, and then I was finding more and more of these combinations in other arts, not only the reliefs, uh, but I still like to look at them, and I think. Uh, this clusters of uh, animals and human shapes form really beautiful, solid uh, things. Cool. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Billy, your turn. Okay. <laughs> um, I think regarding the moon, I think it functions in at least a couple different ways in my work. Um, just technically, it can sometimes be just a, a, a compositional form that I think is necessary. I want to add um, that shape into my compositions. Um, but probably the main reason I'm using it is, again, sort of an emotional, romantic, yearning uh, sense. And I grew up in Maine, seeing some amazing moonscapes. And some of my favorite, you know, memories as a kid was you know, driving in the Subaru with my dad at night. And um, he would, you know, pull over and there would be this gigantic moon and we would just look at it together. And I just had these very tender memories of the moon and sort of how it um, cast everything in this otherworldly glow. Um, and then a lot of the paintings from art history that I love uh, use the moon to sort of create this romantic image. Uh, one of my first biggest influences was Caspar David Friedrich and um, the way that he showed nature as being sublime, often with his sense of lighting or his use of lighting, really resonated with me. And it just, today it's a tool that um, I keep coming back to because it just fulfills this um, emotional piece that I need in my work. That said, I'm trying hard not to use the moon in all of my works because I don't want to be, um, I don't want this to be a non-negotiable or I don't want to be pigeonholed, but that's actually really difficult for me. I keep coming back to it. It's like, I mean, the moon has, you know, magnetism and it feels almost like it's, it has this magnetic force in my work. Um, but something about the night and dusk and twilight in general, I love that time of day. I just, it brings with it a lot of um, introspection and contemplation, which, I'm definitely an introvert and I just feel um, there's something very uh, almost like vibrating and enthralling to me about that sort of darkness and then um, the moon. So it functions both emotionally and then as a compositional um, factor that I can use to enhance the composition. Thank you, that, that's great. I think. Yeah, I, I relate to a lot of what you were saying about kind of you don't want to be pigeonholed and mm -hmm. 
in my own kind of experience teaching my students, I always tell them, try to look outside, you know, find different solutions. But I, I, I also feel like there's also this like delicate space of that impulse or intuition, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you just somehow keep stumbling on that same motif over and over. You don't know why. And I, I spent, there, there were times I spent four months just making a bunch of paintings of feet. And it sounds really ridiculous, but that's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and that's why I, I feel like there, when Maria says, I'm just doing this because it's fun. I think that is enough. It's good enough of a reason in itself that this is why I do it just because, you know, and I think that's a hard space. The more you make art, you realize you, you want to evolve with it, but also over time, like there are things that you keep stumbling upon become kind of a, a strong stronghold. Like it, it's like a, you almost kind of made a landmark for yourself. It, it's a very personal, intimate space because it's symbolic. So I think that that being like kind of a double edged sword, you know, it could you, it could deepen your experience in, in that particular maybe pictorial image. But also on the other hand, it's like, am I missing out on other things? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a constant. There's this constant tension and in some way, I kind of embrace that space because I think it's it's uniquely artists. You know, mm -hmm. it's just something that we think about all the time. People don't think about this. Like they don't think about, oh, I put the moon in that painting again. And people are like, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> you know. So oh. I think it's it's a very yeah, it's it's just a very strange space to be in. Um, so I know that I've kind of briefly asked you guys if you would like to show images, some images. Um, I think I gave you guys a few prompts, but since you were talking about um, kind of the influences you have in your life, I thought it would be a good segue if you have any images that you would like to show um, of artworks that you are influenced by or are currently thinking about. Even if it's just, just like this, this person changed my life or this painter changed my life or um, if you guys have any images you want to show or talk about them for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> I have a couple, but yeah, you go first. Okay, I have a few images, but I'm not sure how I can share. Ah, here, share screen. You should be a host. Am I a host? You're a co-host. Oh, I'm so honored, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know how to navigate Zoom. Okay, so I have, I have it here. Let me share and Yay. let me see how I can play. I think it's this, nope. Um, yeah, it's this computer which I don't use too often. I think it's maybe this, oh, perfect. Yeah, so you asked, oh, it's playing right away. How can I pause it? I'm oh, sorry. Um, so I have a few images. Um, the first question you asked about, I think, uh, the pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. Pivotal moment in yes. your life that affected right. kind of your art making process. So my pivotal moment was a meeting with Ken Kuli, which was very brief, um, and it happened in 2018 first. So he changed everything for me the whole life, not only art related. And um, how it happened, I saw these three uh, collages by him. I think uh, like the left one is from uh, 1999. Uh, and I was just curious about the person and how he makes these collages. It was pretty basic curiosity. So I realized that he was coming to Washington state and given a workshop, and it was a short workshop, three day long uh, here on one of the islands. And I attended the workshop and I think he said a lot of valuable things there. And I'm not sure I understood many of them, maybe none of them, but somehow, <laughs> but somehow he found simple words um, to make me work in a certain direction and come back. So a year later, I came back and I didn't like, uh, we were collaging in the workshop, but I didn't collage after the workshop. 
Uh, so when I came back, I got back to collages. And um, on the last day, uh, he gave us, like we worked from our own works and uh, he gave us some images which was similar in a way to the theme we worked on or something like that. And we're supposed to work from them. And it was such a great pleasure and it was so much fun. So what I got, I got three images I included two in this um, slideshow. So uh, the one on the left is an icon of annunciation and the one on the right is three uh, gracious. So, uh, it was so much fun to detach in a way from the object I was looking at and to work with random papers pretty much which I had, um, not worrying about anything uh, and just playing and enjoying. So after this workshop, um, for some time, I was just going to the library, grabbing random books, finding random images, which I liked, and I was collaging from them. And I think at that time I started understanding what Ken was talking about in his workshop. Um, and it was like my own discovery. He's such magical teacher, the best teacher on the planet. He somehow doesn't, doesn't say you how to think, but he makes you discover um this way of thinking by yourself so i started discovering it when i was collaging from images uh and i had very few but i think good thoughts <laughs> on uh color and composition like i feel that before i met kian i was i had a lot of confusion uh i had questions which are ridiculous in a way like i was not sure what balance means what harmony means. And these are questions which should not be even asked. Like we all know what harmony is, it's when we feel good. And uh, what balance is, is also when we feel good. And I couldn't answer to myself about my work, if it was balanced or if it was harmonious. And I think when I was working with this uh, papers and I was collagen, uh, I finally realized that, that it just about that I feel good and uh, that something makes me happy and gets together and detached from any sorts of ideas. It's just um, the image and the feeling. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I should read those, probably I won't. I told you a brief explanation of this. <laughs> uh, yes, so about the color, my biggest discovery was that just the love to the color and uh if you love the color it's harmonious for you pretty much hmm. and the composition i thought um uh, that so i wrote that there is a moment when all shapes in the picture suddenly start to have a meaning uh in contrast to the original idea this meaning cannot longer be described with words no need to continue working on the picture after that. So it's like, I felt that um, when something surprising is happening and the shapes become shapes and they gain their own stories, they detach from the original verbal idea and live their own life. And then when the story looks complete in terms of shapes, uh, then the image looks complete, at least for me. So this kind of thought. I still believe in it. It really happens that I have a thought and then years later, I think it was a good thought. <laughs> I think I think that that also like comes down to the beauty of being able to create works that speak for themselves. And I, I think often when I say that to my students, they get kind of confused. They're like, what do you mean? Um, and, you know, the basics of form, you know, it's it, it can tell so much and how there, you can create narrative in the way that you put the forms together, not so much of what the forms are, you know, like there's different ways of creating a story. You can, you can depict 
you know, a scene where there are just a lot of figures dancing or whatever, but the way that you put the shapes together can also be a story in themselves. And I think that's kind of maybe what you're touching on a little bit too, about how just simply reacting to the shapes and the colors and how these things eventually come together and form harmony. I think that's a wonderful way of kind of experimenting and, and just diving in to making and responding to the things that you're you're making um i love ken <laughs> he's a great teacher very much yes and a great person so what i mean by uh story of the shapes let's see if i can yeah i can go back here like um can i point yes so like this blue zigzag is probably a part of a dress um i even don't know now it's not that important uh, but it becomes certain character in a way, and uh, how these shapes create one shape is also maybe it was a person. More likely, it was a person, uh, but it doesn't important any longer when um, the shapes make sense with each other. So they create mm -hmm. something what excites me without knowing that it is a person. Great. And I had a question like, um, Ken works with this painted papers and that's what we were doing in the workshop. And I painted a lot of them, like really a lot. Uh, I didn't think about any harmony, um, any group of colors, nothing. And I constantly had a question, like what colors would be right to work with and how much I should follow what I see and how much I can uh, just rely on an accident. And um, I took this note, which I think was good, but very short. The color picked first is the right color. However, it will be changed. I feel like everything in life is that way. Whatever we pick yeah. first is the right thing, but it will be changed. No That's matter. Great. Yeah, and this is my favorite things. Um, I like a lot of things. And um, I like to spend a lot of time in museums, mm, but, there are a few things which like um how i feel about them is not changing almost i always feel like my heart beats faster when i see those um and the first one is icons mm. and this is uh james castle I learned about him very recently in 2019. Uh, and I feel like I have some good connection with what he was doing. And we are um, somehow I like him from long ago and I still have the same level of emotions when I see his works. Yeah, and another thing you asked about uh, was animals and animals and people in combination. So I keep looking at Roman reliefs and these two reliefs are actually one of my favorites there in the Getty collection uh, on Getty Villa. And I really like, especially the one on the right, uh, it's like a long relief about the gardens and there are little animals there over here. I really like them. And these are some vases also from, I think they are from the Getty, or could be from Philadelphia, from the pen. I think from the Getty. They're beautiful. They are magical. Yeah. And this is um, textile piece. Uh, it's a painting on fabric. It's a big one, uh, but on the photo, it's a small corner of it. Uh, it's in Philadelphia Art Museum. I really like this one. When I'm around, I always go see it. And I usually draw in the museums and um, I draw pretty randomly. Uh, so these drawings are from the pen uh, in Philadelphia, from archaeological museum. And I actually like to go to archaeological museums much more than to the art museums because I think uh, all everything what is in the art museum is rooted in archaeological museum anyway. So these are just 
different scenes with the animals. And I think they sell like on the right, uh, this is stamps, you know, this round stamps from yeah. Buck. Mm -hmm. And um, the ones on the left, I believe are Etruscan vases. Yeah. At least I wrote, this is the vase and this is also the vase that's, <laughs> that's the barrel, to not forget. Uh, and uh, this, I don't have the original image of it. Uh, so I spent lovely days uh, in Mount Gretna School of Art in the beginning of the week. And they have fantastic collection of books there. And uh, I found this book, A History of Rome and the Romans from Romulus to John uh, 23rd. Uh, so I found, I think it was a medal, like a uh, little metal piece uh, with a with relief. Uh, in, I love the combinations of people and animal. And I think all these little coins and drinks, they are the best, all of those shapes. And this also was a small thing, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, it's also coming from the same book. I just like the combination of shapes. Whatever this circle is, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and you ask some pictures of the studio. Um, I don't have many, but I thought most of my process is happening outside. And um, this is a photo of the place I go often. This is uh, Snoqualmie River. Uh, it's called uh, Chinook Bend, uh, this little park. And once in a while, I meet one person there, but mostly it's no one. And it's changing, uh, like the river is pretty strong there and it changes the land uh, dramatically every year and even a few times a year. And each time I go, I don't know what I will discover there. So I like this place very much. Uh, and I like to get lost there in the jungles and trees which have floats in and got stuck in other trees. It's always so impressive. And uh, the bench is a part of my project. I had a bench project. Great. So I had an idea that um, everywhere where I like to go and paint, I'll put a bench. So some of them disappear. Some of them are still in place. <laughs> so this one is still in place because I think there are not too many people walking by. And also it's pretty heavy. Like I carried it with my husband together and um, it's pretty heavy. So it's part of, yeah, it's actually made of um, my friend's fence. So it's very precious. Great. And oh. these are the trees which I run. So I consider this to be my studio mostly. Uh, so the yellow trees are right behind my house. Like I live uh, on the power line trail and uh, I, I see this view. Doesn't matter where I go, I see it first. And uh, the trees on the left are some spring trees, well, maybe late winter trees, also on Snoqualmie River, slightly different place than Chinook Bend, but I like them very much. It's like a hill uh, covered with these trees and you see the trunks all the time and these rounded shapes, I love them. Uh, and this is where I go if I'm back from my outside studio. <laughs> beautiful it's it's good to really see the kind of very variation of the things that you're working with and jacob also said he loves your range of influences i think that's pretty evident in kind of different iterations of these influences that show up in your work um i i do want to spend a little time seeing some of the lillian i, I don't i know we have cutting a little short we have 30 minutes left so lillian i don't know if you want to go ahead and even just show like a few images, um, whichever yes. you decide to um, do. <laughs> sure, I don't have a ton of images to show, but let me just do this second. Um, I will show some things that I'm, oops, give me one second. No worries. Okay. Share my screen. Okay, can you see this? Yes, I see Favorite a white screen. screen. Oh, you see the white screen? Yeah. Oh, um, one second. Let me give this another try. Dun, dun, dun. Share screen. Oh, I see. Okay, can you see there this? You yep. Okay. 
Um, so I don't have many images to show, but I thought I would just go through a couple of the key paintings that have influenced me. Um, this painting, Monk by the Sea by Caspar David Friedrich, um, totally changed my life when I first started studying it. I have never seen it in person, which I'd love to do. Um, but for me, it's not just about, <clears throat> well, there are the textures, but then also the scale and the way that he makes, he sort of dwarfs this figure um, amongst the power of nature. That was super exciting to me. Um, and also this one, he does this series of arcs of light. Um, and I thought a lot about in my own work, how nature can be sublime and both terrifying and literally awesome. And I was influenced by, you know, Caspar David Friedrich and other German romantics very much. Um, I also, this is one of the photographers who I am super inspired by. This is Edward Steichen. And he made me believe that I can make painterly photographs. And I was so drawn to the way that he created these uh, very moody, atmospheric um, photographs. And to this day, I mean, I just love him. He's part of a movement called the Pictorialists. And it was an early movement in photography um, that sort of encouraged experimentation and the results. I mean, I encourage you to look at the group. There are some amazing pictorialists, um, but they are all very painterly with a focus on atmosphere and nature. So this series, um, I created in Iceland and I was very much thinking about the pictorialists and thinking about ways to just enhance the atmosphere of my photo montages. Um, and so Edward Steichen was a big influence. Minor White is another photographer whom I love. And I just, I pulled this one up for a couple of reasons. Um, it shows him doing a double exposure or sandwiching negatives, which is a really old photographic technique. And even though I'm not in the dark room, I am using, I think, photographic techniques that are not new. So yes, I use Photoshop a lot to assemble my pieces. And obviously Photoshop is a new invention, um, but the act of compositing images is not new. Um, and I love how Minor White sandwiched these negatives together of a piece of wood and then a landscape. Um, and I'm pretty sure that moon wasn't originally a moon. I think it was probably some photographic blip, but it is perfect. Um, and I also love that, you know, this is such a strong image, even though the entire background is out of focus. Um, so people like this really make me feel encouraged to experiment and um, be okay with, you know, a lack of perfection. Um, finally, this is another minor white photograph that um, inspires me, especially today when I'm, <sighs> I think architecture has played a role, a bigger role in my recent work. Um, I'm inspired by main houses and then just sort of this stark geometry. And I love this photograph and how it's very abstract, even though it's extremely straightforward. Um, but he took this photograph of um, the side of a house covered in snow. And it's just, it's unbelievably striking and it sort of transforms something that we see every day into something brand new. So I've been thinking a lot about hard lines and geometry mixed with softness. Um, and we can see that in some of my works here. And my current, oops, this is me in my studio, um, which is the world. I mean, I don't have um, a studio per se. I work out of my apartment and then I shoot outside. Um, but my favorite 
painter from art history right now is this Finnish artist named Veiko Vianoja. And every single work of his that I've seen, I just devour. And I've never seen any of them up close in person. I've only looked at digital images, but oh my gosh, he just, he is a constant source of inspiration. Um, there is something so tender and quiet and sort of charged in his paintings. And he's someone I'm constantly looking at. And I think those are all I've shown of, um, yeah, his work. But, oops, let me just get back here. Um, if you look at more of his work, and I'll type his name in the chat box, he does a lot of interior scenes that look out to landscapes seen through windows. And I've never really incorporated interior um, environments into my practice before, but he's making me very much want to sort of embark on a project that is focused on the indoors or maybe the indoors looking out. So that's something that might be on the horizon. Cool, thank you, Lillian. Yeah, and Maria, thank you both. Um, I, I really love the minor white mm -hmm. photography, something about abstracting reality. I think that's a very interesting space to push for. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, I don't have any more profound thoughts. <laughs> um, I'm just, yeah, I just think it's interesting like how to pursue that process of like seeing and making and photography kind of giving you that almost like the other side because mm -hmm. we build up images as painters like mm -hmm. we build it up through shapes and colors and lines but in my very little experience of photography i feel like often i'm kind of on the other side where i am abstracting the thing mm -hmm. so i'm reducing it so that it challenges the perception of what's real and what's not we know it's real because it's in front of us but it, it creates this otherworldly experience. And I think that's a really fun space to be in. And I'm glad yeah. you have images. And that's yeah. very much something I'm thinking about. Um, you know, historically photographs were meant to show the truth or show reality. And these days that's um, getting further and further from the truth with filters and, you know, Photoshop. But I still think there's a sense that a photograph is supposed to represent what's really there. So I like sort of playing with that in my work and adding um, a surreal undertone or something that makes the viewer question, is this a real place? What am I looking at? Is this truly how it exists in reality? Um, and I like playing with that aspect of photography to twist the truth or make something like perfect nature how I wish it looked or something right mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's a yeah that's an interesting space to be in for sure um we are kind of close to the end of the talk so I'm gonna open the floor for Q&A um Jacob had two questions for both of you um do either of you have anything you want to explore in your artwork in the near future I'm interested recently in uh, sequences, and I would like to focus on the sequence which I'm doing right now. Um, like, what is interesting is how one image is forming the other image, mm. yeah, uh, that they become one whole thing. Totally. <laughs> um, I am interested in as I was mentioning, sort of bringing it indoors. And I don't know if this will happen anytime soon, but in painting, one of my favorite genres is still life. And I think still lifes can be extremely inventive. And um, I love the idea of sort of incorporating interior scenes, maybe with windows looking out to something different. Um, and then I also would love to make some works that are based in a different time of day. So mm -hmm. the night feels very almost easy and very natural for me, but 
I really want to push myself to experiment with, you know, not twilighty scenes. <laughs> See what happens. So this is kind of like a flip coin question, like the other side of the coin. Also mm -hmm. from Jacob, what are things you're wrestling with right now? Mm -hmm. Either one of you <laughs> can start. <laughs> it's a hard question. It is. Jacob, it was too hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Hard. Um, well, I don't know. Actually, I do feel like I could list many things that I'm wrestling with right now. Uh, among them is sort of getting out of this um mold of representing a similar time of day and then I also really want to work very large I love small works and small paintings and I think there's something super um, precious and intimate about them but most like the vast majority of my work is small and I get excited thinking about sort of being immersed in a large, large print of mine. So that's something that is also on my horizon and that I'm not quite there yet, but I'd like to experiment with some, you know, very large pieces in the future. Very ambitious. When I'm thinking about wrestling, uh, I'm only thinking about the outside world. I think when I work, I'm not wrestling, I'm living my normal life feels good <laughs> good great i like your i like your spirit it's very freeing just hearing you talk about just your process and what motivates you i need more of that um garrett maria uh, this is from garrett sorry i didn't mean to just scream oh, yeah. at garrett. <laughs> i think everybody can see the chat box maria i was excited about your benches remaining or enduring when you placed them do you think about how your work might be experienced by others in a distant future? Experienced by others. I know how my benches will be experienced by others. They constantly are my work. It will be better to ask the others how they yeah. experience it. it. It's very interesting now like to see how Missy experienced it and how she put all this together. It's very unexpected in a way mm -hmm. funny and exciting. Great. Well, feel free to keep rolling in some questions. I actually have one. I have a lot of questions written. I just needed to like save it in case people have more questions, but feel free to submit more questions. Um, so a question for me would be, what are some misconceptions people have or might have about your work? And this is more, it, it requires maybe more of an imagination if you have not had that encounter with people misunderstood your work or whatnot. One of the very first reactions I got to my work, a lot of people said it looked like a dystopic future, which was like very antithetical to what I was trying to portray. In fact, the concept of utopia is something I'm fascinated by. And I was doing a lot of reading about utopia and I would love, I mean, my pieces, come from or like are inspired by an imagined utopia so um I sort of understand where people are coming from when they get dystopic vibes because you know there are no figures it seems a little bit eerie um but and I don't mind that comment at all I think it's interesting but just personally that is something that doesn't align with my thought process while creating the work, which was just interesting to see how it was communicated. But um, yeah, that's that's one. But let me keep thinking. Did that change the way you created the artworks afterwards, after that particular statement? It didn't change, but it's something I constantly think about. Um, and <laughs> which is, you know, it's not like, a hindrance, but it's on my mind a lot. Um, someone also said that it, you know, I don't mind when people say these things, but they've likened it to, you know, the backgrounds in Star Wars or Harry Potter. <laughs> and um, it's just like not what I'm thinking about as I'm creating the work. And, but anyway, I, I think all of those comments are valid and interesting, but I, and they haven't 
profoundly affected how I've worked moving forward, but I'm, I'm careful not to lean too into those themes or I try not to at least. Yeah. I'm so slow. I'm thinking, I, I got to think about Star Wars and then <laughs> I got to think about uh, Garrett's question uh, about experiencing work. And I'm not sure I answered because, um, you know, sometimes I'm not quite sure because the language is not my na native language. Uh, is it about, was it about uh, like seeing the work somewhere or, oh yeah, I answered. I guess it's about how the work, how people might experience um, your work differently in the distant future. I'm not exactly different. sure either. Um, I don't know. Because I think your benches are also part of the work, right? It's it's kind of another project of yours. So I think he's talking about the benches. I could be wrong. Garrett can correct okay. me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Try my best to help. I'm not sure. I, my question, I think, is more ab about, you talked about f being afraid of forgetting. So, like, you're documenting the work for yourself, um, in a way. Um, but do you think about that documentation serving others in the future? Like, you named some artists that influenced you. And, I don't know, from the distant past. Um, I just wondered if you ever imagine like others kind of coming and just stumbling upon your work or whatever, like like the benches, but also your visual um, paintings. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Garrett. Yeah. Uh, well, when I see others' works uh, of people who sort of documented what was happening to them, it's exciting for me to look. Um, if my work ever excites someone because it was sort of documentation of the time, that's awesome. If not, that's awesome. <laughs> I like your attitude. <laughs> Great, I hope that answered the question. We have a question from Neo um, for Lillian. From today's interview, I can see the idea of the impact of technology. I feel it's a thing that crossed through many aspects of you as an artist, such as the original creative impulse in the beginning during college time to the medium you're currently, you're now using consistently like Photoshop. So I'm curious about your opinion about the more current trend of AI painting or image making. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it is, shocking how far AI has come and it's um it does frighten me a little bit because I I really just I like personal connections and I am worried that we're going to be living in a future that is just very digital um so I think it's great that people are experimenting with AI I don't think there's anything um personally it's not a, a medium I think I'll start using, although I've, I have played around with it on the DALI site and it's impressive what it can come up with. Um, I'm still wrapping my head around it, to be honest. So I don't have a totally concrete, succinct answer, but um, you know, if we start talking about AI images going into museums or galleries, that's an interesting question. And for me, I miss seeing the artist in those works. I miss seeing the like the hand of the artist or the the thought process broken down. So I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, I mean, it's sort of sublime in the original sense of the word. Like it's terrifying and awesome. Um, the how far technology has come is super impressive. But as an art form. I have my, like, I'm on the fence about it. Um, I don't think it's something that I'll start using in my work, but I think it's interesting to think about. And then the whole other side of that is putting those works into galleries and museums. And I'm not sure how I feel about that yet. Um, 
it's it's an interesting question that I want to keep uh, thinking about, but I have it stirs a lot of mixed emotions in me, <laughs> just to put it shortly. I've seen some wonderful AI images. Mm -hmm. and there are times when I look at them and I was like, wow, why do I still paint? why do I still paint? You know, these computers can do a better job than I do. But I'm not I'm not like kind of giving you a reason for it. But I think like in my own processing of that, it's like because it matters to me, mm -hmm. it's personal to me mm -hmm. and to other, you know, people, it may not seem that much of a difference. You know, mm -hmm. if I were to put in the similar prompts through an AI generator, they might actually make images that look better than the ones that I make. Mm -hmm. But what I find comfort in is just the fact that this matters to me and mm -hmm. this enriches me as a person. Mm -hmm. But to echo kind of that sentiment, I, I definitely feel similarly. I I don't know how to feel. I have mixed feelings about them. And it's a, it's a huge can of worm. You know, it's like, we don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. in the next five years or 10 years or how technology takes off and would painting still be around, you know, mm -hmm. all these mediums that are still kind of central to what we call studio art, would it be replaced by digital art or AI who can mm -hmm. actually come up with these ideas at a much, much faster rate than we do? Um, just, just some thoughts. Totally. Yeah. It's really thought provoking. I mean, it's something I like thinking about, and I can just like sort of fall into a rabbit hole thinking about all the pros and cons. I think it's a pretty complicated topic. Um, a friend of mine from school is getting very into AI art and it seems to be really working for him. Like I can see him realizing themes he talked about in school, but wasn't able to realized by hand and now he's creating these complex images with AI that feel like they're furthering his practice so it's just it's complex yeah what is AI it's a artificial intelligence ah sorry we should have clarified no it's a new world for me so I'm doing it yeah yeah um Jacob just had a quick comment he mm -hmm. said that he was obsessed with making AI art for about two days. I was there. He would not look at me. No, he mm -hmm. did look at me. Sorry. He was just really busy looking at the phone. I thought I would use it to start paintings, but quickly figured out that sketching is actually more efficient. Mm -hmm. So it's a good tool. I feel like it's a really good tool to kind of hash out ideas and see how far along something could come. And I'm just happy to hear that he's no longer in that space. Mm -hmm. I was a little concerned. <laughs> Um, and Neo said, yes, the question here for more, go to the aspect of the idea of tool and your opinion towards it. The evolutions go with it, especially in the context we're having here, painting, photography, AI. I'm not exactly sure what the last bits are about, but I think it's, it's kind of similar to what I was saying, just AI being a tool. Um, hopefully it stays that way, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I would love to continue to paint. And, and not feel like I'm competing with this artificial intelligence in any way. Right. And at the, yeah, as I'm thinking about it more, um, I think all mediums when they were brand new had sort of a revolt against them. Like definitely photography was considered super, um, well, it was revolutionary, but it was also very strange. And then with digital photography, there was a whole nother sort of backlash. Right. So I think when there's anything this new and drastic that sort of is a game changer, there will be a major reaction that spreads the spectrum of um, being into it and totally against it. So I agree that it's probably not going anywhere and it's only going to keep improving and getting stronger and stronger. So I'm keeping an open mind and um, it'll definitely be a tool that people continue to use, which is great. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, again, I just, it, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll, we'll see, but anyway, I have to think about it more. Yeah. Those are very thought provoking questions. Mm -hmm. um, we are kind of close to the end. So I think to close out the exhibition, 
if either of you have news of what's coming up, if you have shows or even if for people to stay in touch, how, what's the best way to kind of learn about you and keeping in touch with your, your work? Lillian, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, I don't have any shows coming up, but you can get in touch with me um, through Instagram. My handle is Lillian Day Thorpe. Uh, my website is lillianday.com and you can send me an email through there. And yes, I'm just, I was grateful to be a part of this. And again, it was so nice to meet Maria and I really like this conversation. Yeah, the same thing. Uh, like I have Instagram and I try to keep my website updated as much as possible. Uh, and it's pretty easy to find me if you just Google Maria Michurina artwork, something like that. Um, out of the events in January, I'm going to teach uh, a workshop through PN Studio School. Uh, oh, okay. fun. Yeah, I'm very excited. And I see some people here who signed up and I'm super excited. Uh, and another new thing starting from February, I'm going to stay in residency in James Castle uh, house in Boise. So mm -hmm. I will be there. Yeah. Thank you. And I will be there through end of April. I think it will be until April 19th. And I'm also very excited about that. So during this time, there will be, to my knowledge, four public events, probably workshops, talks, open studios. I'm not sure in what order and when exactly, uh, but I'll try to keep my uh, Instagram uh, with this information. Awesome. Thank you, guys. This has been wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Um, your Thank participation you. really helps and move things along. And I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, best of luck to you both and whatever you kind of venture into um, both in your artwork and your other parts of your life. Um, thank you everyone for being here and uh, stay tuned for more. We will post this recorded Zoom on YouTube. So if you know anyone that wants to rewatch, feel free to refer them to us. Um, that way we can direct them. All right. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It's thank been you. great. Thank you so much. All right. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.